Okay, so today's shear is the first of uh, two parts here, at least, uh, called That Time Uncle Has Resurrected Jesus Through Necromancy, okay? And we're going to go through a very wacky midrash. <laughs> um, and uh, the plan for today is to go through the facts and then raise a bunch of questions and then do one methodological like uh, move, which is going to be a good methodology tool for approaching Midrashim in general. And then we can start to speculate and work on the uh, the interpretation and answering our questions. Uh, but I am not, um, if we only got through the questions and the methodology today, then I'd be fine with that and then save the analysis for next time. We'll see where we're, where we're at. Um, two prefaces, three prefaces. One is that... Um, uh, my, uh, I'm baking a pie and, uh, it's not done yet. So I need to, uh, pause this year in about, uh, seven minutes, uh, to check on the pie. Uh, the other preface is that something happened that has never happened before. Um, a website that I would use for one of the texts is down. Um, this is not available on Aha Torah on, or on Safaria. It's on dot, dot AC dot ill and it's down. So we're going to have to make recourse to a less than ideal text. And then the third preface is, I don't remember. Okay, so let's start. Um, okay, so the Gemara is from Gittin Daf Nun Vav Amadez. And uh, if you've ever done or heard of the Gemara of uh, of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, um, about why the Yushalayim was destroyed um, and the base Mikdash was destroyed, uh, it's this is from the end of that Gemara, okay? And apparently, I've just never gotten that far in the Gemara before. Um, in fact, if you were here for my Tisha B'Av Shir this summer... Um, then we did the destruction of Betar, and that's really where um, uh, where this Gemara, like, I think this Gemara is like slightly after the one that we did, okay? So there's a long um, series of Gemaras about the destruction of the base of Mikdash, and the reason why on, on the screen I have this in gray is because this is really not related to our Midrash. It's really the, um, the end of the previous unit, but there's a fact that is, uh, that is necessary for our... Um, our what do you call um our our uh, unit so this is not going to make any sense amar abaye naktinan so abaye said we have a tradition piv shel nechoshes b'tzi pornov shel barzel uh okay so this is the whole thing uh anyone know who titus was in terms of us in terms of the jewish uh, people like what role he had with the jewish people he destroyed the base of Mikdash. Yeah, he was the one who actually destroyed the base of Mikdash, uh like the second base of Mikdash. so um the gemara has a whole thing about how this gnat uh bored into his head and they found it when he died and it was like uh like the size of a bird okay a very weird thing um so the gemara says that this net was um made of copper and its claws were of iron uh and then it says kihava kamais when he was dying amra luhu he said to his attendants likluha lahu gavra ulubadre likitme ashive yami uh so he says um burn that man okay and that man is a reference to himself okay this is a um a, a common uh style of euphemisms where if you are i don't know if this is like was in the ancient world or if this is just in in gemara or just in aramaic but like many times Chazal will uh if we're talking about something bad then instead of saying that this bad thing's going to happen to me we phrase it as happening to a third party so, for example, many times in the Gemara, if you ever see a Gemara that says, um, you know, God will do X, Y, Z to the Sone Yisrael, to the enemies of Israel, usually that means that he'll do something bad to Israel. But we don't want to say God will do something bad to Israel. So we we talk about it as though it's happening to someone else. So when Titus says, um, he says, uh, uh, burn that man, he really means burn my own body. So burn that man and scatter his ashes over the seven seas. So that God, the God of the Jews, should not find me and stand me up for judgment. Okay, so that was basically his dying wish is burn my body and scatter my ashes on the seven seas so that um uh so that uh God can't judge me. Okay. So um before we go on, I I remember what I was gonna say now. Um so what do you know about Uncleos? Who is Uncleos? Why do we care about him? What's his his uh, his story? Anyone? Surely you've heard the name Uncleos. Just tell me what you know about him. Yeah, Vega. Um. So I know there was a thing. I think one of his 
grant like one of his uh grandfathers or someone was like a big roman general who was okay. an enemy of the jews okay um and there's also a story about how um or maybe it was somebody somebody close to him in his family uh and romans came to like get him he converted to judaism the right. romans didn't like that very much okay. uh they tried to send guards to convert him he ended up sorry to bring him back he ended up converting them to judaism <laughs> yeah okay and good also that he was like the first to translate the the torah okay. into yeah okay good so the the two major facts are that that we should care about here are that uh unclos was a roman convert okay and in fact uh he has a name i always forget what it is unclos um oops sorry uh, the Wikipedia page says Unculus, um, possibly identical to Aquila of Sinope, was a Roman national who converted to Judaism in Tanaitic times. Uh, around, or he lived from 35 to 120 CE, um, and he's considered to be the, the author of the Targum Unculus. So Targum Unculus is the, as Vega says, the authoritative um, Aramaic translation of the Torah. So he authored the Targum Unculus, uh, authoritative. Uh, Aramaic translation of the Torah. And, um, you know, this translation is authoritative because it is based on the um, on the traditions he received from his rabbin, which, let's see if the, uh, I always forget who it is. Um, yeah, this is said to have been under the gu direct guidance and instruction of the Tanaim Yehoshua ben Hanania and Elias ben Hirkanos. Okay, so this is such a, you know, a prominent um, translation that there's actually a rabbinic uh, obligation that we every week do Shnai Mikra of the Echad Targum. We read the entire Parsha um, in Hebrew twice and then once with the Targum Unkelos. Also, back in the day, then they used to um, translate, uh, sorry, they used to do the public Torah readings and they would read it in Hebrew and then translate it with Unkelos uh, after each reading. And then I think the Yemenite Jews still do that today. Okay, so so huge Tamid Chacham and convert. Okay, so this is going to be the story of his conversion. And I think that this is, again, I apologize for this. This is a good time to check out my pie before we start the Gemara. So I'm going to pause this. Hold on just a second. And then it's... Okay, so here's the Gemara. Um, and I've translated it here. And then after, this is a long Gemara. So we'll, we'll go through and review after. Unculus bar Colonicos, bar Achasi de Titus. Unculus, the son of Colonicos, was the son of Titus's sister. So this is Titus's nephew. Hava by Liguri. He wanted to convert to Judaism. Azal, he went, Aske Latidus he and he went and he raised Titus from the grave through necromancy. Okay, and necromancy, I'm translating here as necromancy. Rashi says, um, Nigida is Ove. So if you've heard of the, you know, the Torah prohibition against uh, consulting an Ove or Yudoni, um, or doing an act of Ove or Yudoni, or you know the story about Shmuel uh, being raised uh, for Shaul through uh, an Ove, that's what this is talking about here. Okay. Amar Le, he said to Titus, Man Hashiv Bahahu Alma, who is important in that world? Okay, and presumably he's asking him about um not who's important. Okay, I'll give, yeah. He's asking him who's important in, 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 in the world where you're in. Okay. Let's not get into like, you know, is Titus an Olam Haba or not, you know, but in in the story, it's in the afterlife. Okay. So uh Amarle, he Titus said to him, Yisrael, Israel. So Unglo says, Mahu Li'id Buki Buhu. Should I cling to them? Now, that means should I convert to Judaism and become a member of the Jewish people? Um, but, you know, you notice in the beginning, it says by le'igure, from the word ger. This is le'idbuki, which means like from dabak, to, should I cling to them? You know, and that's a, a common phrase for conversion of like joining the Jewish people. But I think that the um, the emphasis is on like the becoming a member of the nation as opposed to the like acceptance of mitzvahs. Okay. So, so he's framing his question in terms of, should I join the Jewish people? Amar le, so Titus said to him, mi laihu nefishin, uh, their matters are many. Okay. And that really is referring to the mitzvahs. Okay. They have many mitzvahs. Velomatis minhu. And you will not be able to fulfill them. Okay. So what should you do? Zil igribuhu. Go and uh, wage war with them. Okay. Or in, uh, um, uh, you know, go to battle with them. Bihahu Alma in that world, meaning in your world, the Havisa Resha, and you will become a chief, a Rosh. Dixiv, as it says in uh Echa, Hayutsa Rehala Rosh. Um, her foes have become the head. Okay, and the rest of the puzzle, I don't know if it matters, but the rest of the puzzle says, um, Oibeha Shaluki, Adashem Hoga Aro Pashaha, Olaleha Al Hushvi Lifnetsar. Uh her enemies are at ease, for Hashem has caused her grief because of her many crimes. Her children went into captivity before the foe. Okay, but in other words, um, 
Hayusarela Rosh, her enemies became the Rosh. And then Titus explains, Kol HaMetzarli Yisrael Nase Rosh. Anyone who afflicts the Jews becomes the head. Okay, so uh, so don't convert. Go to war with the Jews and you'll become prominent. Amr Leis, Uncle said to him, Dine Dehahu Gavra Bamai. What is your punishment? And again, literally this means what is the punishment of, of that man? But he's asking, what is your punishment? Um, uh, Amr Le, he said, Bimai de Pasik Anafshe, uh, that which he decreed against himself. Kol Yoma Michnashile Lakitme, Vidaini Le, Vikalule, Umavadru Asheve Yami. Every day his ashes are gathered, they judge him, they burn him, and they scatter him over the seven seas. Okay, now this is why I wanted to read the first part of the Gemara, because this is basically what Titus said to his attendants to do to his body so that he wouldn't be judged, which is namely burn my body and scatter over the seven seas so that God doesn't stand me up in judgment. That's what is happening to him in the next world, is he's being every day burned, he's being judged, and then, uh, sorry, the ashes that were scattered are being gathered, then he's being judged, and then they're burning him and scattering him again. Okay, so that's the Titus phase. Of this midrash. Okay, next, Azil Askila Bilam. Uncleus then went and raised Bilam through necromancy. Obviously, that's what you do. Um, and Amrle he said to him, "Man Chashi Behu Ama, who is prominent in that world?" Uh, Amrle he said to him, "Yisrael, Israel. Mahu Idbuki Behu. Should I convert? Should I join them?" Uh, Amrle he said, "Lo Tidrosh Shlomam Vitovasam Kol Yamecha Leolam." Do not you shall not seek their peace or their welfare all the days. Oh, you know I meant to actually include this in the uh, uh, in the document here. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll ask you. Does anyone know where that phrase is from? I mean, obviously it's from Devarim twenty three seven. Do not seek out their peace or their welfare all the days. Anyone know the uh, what that's referring to? So I'll give you a hint. It's in the laws of waging war. Is it about Amalek? Uh, no, it's not. But uh, it is uh, something that would come up if you're learning about Amalek, uh, even though it's not directly about Amalek. Is it like Moab or Ammon? Yes. So it's about Moab and Ammon. Okay, good. And uh, what is uh, what are we being told? This is an actual mitzvah of don't seek out their good or their welfare. Uh, anyone know what that's referring to uh, halakhically? Okay, so... Um, uh, the halacha in the Rambam is found in Hilkos Malachim Umil um, chapter six. Okay, so the halacha says, "Ein osim milchama im adam ba'olam achikorin lo l'shalom." We do not wage war with anyone in the world until we call out to them for peace. Echad milchamas harushus, echad milchamas mitzvah. Whether it is an optional war or a mitzvah war, Shnei Marazit says, "Ki sikrav el ir lehilacha malacha b'krasa ilah l'shalom." Uh, when you approach a city to do battle with it, you shall call out to them in peace. If they make peace with us, and if they accept the seven mitzvahs that B'nai Noach uh, were commanded in, then we don't kill anyone. Uh, and they become a, 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 like a, what do you call it? There's a fancy word for this, but they become like a, a dependent like colony of Israel. Oh, you're not supposed to mention Israel and colony these days, but anyway. Um, they will become a uh, there's a fa fancy word for this tribute tributary they say be subjugated okay fine a tribute yeah uh, and uh, and and they will serve you okay fine so then it goes through halachos about um, about uh, what that means uh, for them to become a tribute okay but so this is whenever we wage war then we do this okay however Amonu Moab uh, but if we're going to war with Amon and Moab, in Sholin Lahen Lashalom, we do not ask them for peace. We don't offer peace. Shinemar, as it says, Lo Tidrosh Shlomam Vitovasam. Do not seek out their peace or their good. Okay. Um, and that is Koli uh, Mechalilam for all the days, uh, uh, all the days. Okay. Does the puzzle explain why? Hold on. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah. So the Pasuk says uh, the reason why. Okay, so this is the, the context of this in Devarim is all of the laws about um, about restrictions on joining the Jewish people in marriage. Okay, so it starts off with Gimel. Lo yavo mamzer b'kahal ad Hashem. A mamzer who is a, a you know, halachic bastard, someone who's the offspring of uh, Arios may not come into the congregation of Hashem. Gamdor Asiri lo yavo lo Hashem. Even the tenth generation may not enter in the, into the congregation of Hashem, which practically means a mamzer 
cannot marry a native born Jew. A mamza can only marry another mamzeret or a uh, or a ger. Okay, then lo yavo amoni umoavi bikal ad Hashem. Um, an Ammonite or a Moabite may not enter into the congregation of Shem. Gamdor Asiri lo yavo lahem bikal ad Hashem ad olam. Even the tenth generation may not enter into the congregation of Hashem forever. So this is we, Torah Shabbat Pet tells us this is an Ammonite or a Moabite man may not enter into the congregation, but a Moabite woman woman can. Uh, we know this because the famous example of this is Rus, right? Rus uh, converted and and uh, she's the ancestor of uh, of David. Okay, but then the reason it gives is all devar asher lo kidmu eschem balechem uvamayim baderech b'teischem imitraim. Regarding the matter, this is about Amon, that they did not preemptively greet you with water, with bread and water on your way out of Mitzrayim. Okay, so that's the Ammonites. Um, and because they, Moab, hired Bilam, the son of Baor, from uh, Aram Naharaim to curse you. Okay. Uh, Hashem did not desire to listen to Bilam. Uh, and Hashem transformed the curse into a blessing. Because Hashem loves you. Uh, then lo shlomam v'tovasam kol mechalolam. You shall not inquire their peace and their goodness all the days forever. Okay, so in other words, halachically, this means we shouldn't make overtures of peace to Amon and Moab. However, um, uh, the halacha does say v'apapish um, in sholim v'shlomam. Even though we don't ask them for peace, im shishlimu me'atzman tchila mekablin mimeno osam. If they make peace with us, if they often make peace with us, then we accept the peace. Okay, so Bilam is basically telling Onkelos, um, uh, don't seek out their uh, welfare or peace for all the days. Um, uh, meaning, basically, what the Torah says to do to Moab and Ammon, Unclos, you should not seek out the Jews' peace and well for all the days. So then uh, he says, Amrle, so Unclos asks him, Dine didhahu gavar what is the um, uh, the punishment of that man? Okay, Amrle, b'shichah zera rotachas. Um, meaning, what, Bilam, what is your punishment in the next world? Bilam says he's being boiled in boiling semen. Okay, as one does. Okay, then the next step, and then I got to go check on the pie. Um, Amarle, uh, sorry, Azal Aski Benigida Liyeshu Hanotri. Uncleus went and raised Jesus the Nazarite, okay, uh, the Nazarene from the grave. Amarle, and he said, Man Hashibahu Alma, who's prominent in that world? Amarle Yisrael. He said, Israel. Mahuli Buke Bahu, should I cling to them? Amarle, so he says, like Jesus says, Jesus said, Tovasam Drosh, Raasam Lotidrosh. Seek out their good and don't seek out their bad. Okay, as it says, Kol Hanogeabuvas Eno. Anyone who touches them is as if he touched the pupil of his eye. Okay, which you shouldn't do, because that's bad for your eye. Um, that's in Zechariah 2:12. Amrale, so then he asks Jesus, Dini Bahu Dehu Gavra Bamai, what is the um the punishment of that man? Amrale Bitsor Rotachas. Uh, uh, is um, in uh, literally in, uh, being in in boiling feces or boiling excrement. Okay, the Amar Mar, as as Mar said, Kol Hamal Nidon Rotachas. Anyone who mocks the words of the sages shall be sentenced to boiling excrement. And then the Gemara concludes, Tachazi Ma Bein Poshe Yisrael Umas Olam. Come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. Okay, and, and the implication is Bilam, who was a, a navi of the Goyim. Uh, said to harm Israel, but then Jesus, who was just a Jewish sinner, uh, uh, said you should, uh, you know, seek out their well-being. Okay, sorry, I'm going to pause. You can start thinking about questions. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, so let me actually just, um, uh, you know, there's another methodology thing that uh, is just important to be aware of uh, that I'm going to just tell you now, and then... Um, uh, and then we'll then we'll review this and analyze it. Okay, so I was going over this with uh, with a chavrusa who I prepared this with, uh, and um, and you know my chavrusa said I've never heard of a Jesus Gemara before. Okay, and there's a very good reason why. Okay, uh, why why might a person not have heard of a Jesus Gemara before? Either what do you know or what would you guess? Yeah, Fega. Censorship. Censorship, okay, right? So for those who are not aware, <laughs> um, uh, I guess a double not awareness. This is a double PSA. So as you may know from me specifically with the Rambam, uh, I am very, very big on using accurate manuscripts, okay? 
And you should be aware that just as there are many manuscripts of the Mishnah Torah, there are also many manuscripts of Shas, okay? And there are superior ones and inferior ones. Anyone who's learned Gemara seriously, um, like for an extended period of time, will be familiar with the Hagos Habach or the Hagos Hagra, um, who, uh, which is the thing on the side that shows you the correct text of the Gemara. Because, you know, for, for many years, first of all, until the printing press, the Talmud was copied out by hand. And then even, at, even after the printing press, you have publisher's errors, okay? Uh, printing errors or printing uh, uh, bad decisions. Um, but in addition, to, so you have to like, you should use good editions of the Gemara. But in addition to that, you have censorship, okay? Uh, from the Christians. So let me show you, if you look at a standard daf of the Gemara, and you looked at our Gemara here, then here's what it'll say instead of Jesus. Okay, it'll say, um, so you have here um, Bilam, okay, uh, and he asked Bilam, okay, then it says, Azal Aske Benegida Leposhe Yisrael. Then he went and raised from the grave the sinners of Israel. Okay, so the, uh, let's see if this edition has on the side, Posh Yisrael, there's a little gimel there. Um, why am I not seeing the scrolly thing? Hold on. Oh, no, I guess I have to zoom out. Where's the Gimel go? Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, the Gimel in the source of Shah says, Bisfarmachim liyeshu. Okay, so what happened basically is, you know, there were all these um, Christian persecution, persecutions of the Jews, and they would comb through the Talmud and, um, uh, and like, find things that either were or, or that they spun to say that they were against uh, Christianity, and uh, and this resulted in you know burnings of the Talmud, in killings of Jews, um, and so what either they did or what we did preemptively is we replaced or censored or covered up certain things in the Gemara, and this is an example of that. Um, so so Gemaras for probably you know hundreds of years did not say uh, Jesus; they just said Poshe Yisrael. Okay, and another thing you should know. And by the way, if you I'm not going to do this now, but if you look up. Uh, if you Google Talmud Jesus boiling excrement, you will find a bunch of anti-Semitic sites that go through and say, like, this is what the Jews say about Jesus, about our Lord in uh, in in their their Talmud. Okay, um, and so so this continues to today. But another thing that you should know is there are a bunch of Gemaras about Jesus. Okay, but it's not always clear that the Jesus that's being referred to is the Jesus. Okay, uh, the, there are Gemaras about Yeshu, but some want to say that those Gemaras are not really about Jesus. I think that this Gemara is definitely about Jesus because it doesn't just say Yeshu, it says Yeshu HaNotsri, Jesus the Nazarene, which is like the Jesus, you know? So I think it's very hard. Some I've seen see, even seen people say that they don't want to say that this Gemara is about that Jesus, but the context makes it pretty clear that it is about Jesus. Okay, so let's review the Gemara, and then we'll raise all the questions, and obviously there are many questions. Okay, so... What I did was I actually rewrote the Gemara in dialogue form, okay, just to make it easier to process. Um, so I preserved the language. Okay, so I'm going to read it again in my dialogue form. Um, uh, okay. Um, this, okay. Anyone want to, do you want anyone in the mood for some play acting? Anyone want to be, uh, 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 anyone want to be Unclos? I'll be all the bad guys. <laughs> All right, fine, then I'll read it. Okay, so uh, Uncleus Barcolonicos, the son of Titus' sister, wanted to convert to Judaism. He went and raised Titus from the grave through necromancy. Who is important in that world where you are now? Israel. Should I cling to them? Titus says, their commandments are numerous and you will not be able to fulfill them. Instead, go to battle with them in that world and you will become chief. As it is written, her foes have become the head, which means that anyone who distresses Israel will become chief. Unclos says, what is your punishment in the next world? Titus says, that which de is decreed against me uh, is as follows. Every day my ashes are gathered and they judge me and they burn me and they scatter me over the seven seas. Okay, and then note, uh, this is what Unclos, uh, what T uh, Titus asked his men to do to avoid judgment. And that's the fate that he's suffering. Okay, Unclos then went and raised Bilam from the grave through necromancy. Unclos says, who's important in that world where you are now? Bilam says, Israel. Should I cling to them? Bilam says, you shall not seek out their peace or their welfare all the days. And uh, that is the policy that we apply to Moab because of what they did to Israel under Bilam's direction. Unclo says, what is your punishment in the next world? Bilam says, being boiled in, in boiling semen. Unclo then went and raised Jesus the Nazarene from the grave through necromancy. Unclo says, who is important in that world where you are now? Jesus says, Israel. 
When Glow says, should I cling to them? Jesus says, seek out their welfare and do not seek out their misfortune. Uh, for anyone who touches them, it is as if he touched the pupil of his eye. Uncle Lewis says, what is your punishment in the next world? Jesus says, being boiled in boiling excrement. As Mara said, anyone who mocks the words of the sages shall be sentenced to boiling excrement. And the Gemara concludes, come and see the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets of the nations of the world. For Bilam, who was a prophet, wished Israel harm, whereas Jesus, who was a Jewish sinner, sought their well-being. Okay, so there's a lot here. Let's list the the, the questions and... Uh, um, uh, if you need me to scroll up, uh, then just uh, let me know. Okay, so what questions do you have here? Yeah, Ayala. So why is the main thing about like who's important in the world to come? Like, why is that what Unclos cares about? Okay, so why is Unclos asking um, who is important in the world to come? Okay, uh, right. That seems a little trivial. Okay, or uh, or at least not the factor you should be concerned with in a question of conversion. Okay, in a decision to convert. Okay, good. What else? Yeah, Ayala. Also, Titus's answer, like, seems makes a little more sense because he's saying, "Well, the Jews are important in the world to come," but. If you can be like the top in this one. Okay, but right. What do the other two like? How do they respond? Like, why does like yeah. yeah, I guess they don't really have a response to that. Okay, sure. So um, so uh the response uh of Titus makes sense. Um uh the Jews are prominent in the next world, but the opposite in this world. But what what do the answers that Bilam and Jesus give? Like, what is the sense in the answers that J Bilam and Jesus give? What is the sense in the answers? Yeah. Okay, good. What else? Um, would you be able to maybe post a dialogue into the into the chat? Sure, I will try to do that, and uh, we will we will watch uh, Zoom mess up the formatting. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to have to do it bit by bit. Okay. So first there's that. Then there's this. Then there's this. Uh, oh, it's, it's preserving the uh, paragraph breaks. Uh, that's, I, I, I don't understand this. And then there's this. And then there's this. I'm going to give you advice here also is um, try to think to yourself in terms of big picture questions and then questions on the particulars. Yeah, Nava. Well, I kind of have both. Um, I mean, yeah. what's the deal with the necromancy? Not okay, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, that's that is a fine question. Okay, so, um, so what's the deal with the necromancy now i think that question can be asked from different angles so what do you mean when you say what's the deal with the necromancy i mean personally what i'm thinking is why did he choose this route where they're not like other people that he could go okay. to okay so one question is um is uh is why did he, like he's like why did he go this route uh why did he go this route i'm just picturing like like him sitting in front of the base in you know for conversion and they're like so what brought you here and he says well i raised titus bilam and jesus through necromancy and i had to talk with them and it seemed like this is a good idea yeah so like why raise uh rishayim uh through necromancy to um uh to consult for his decision okay now i think you can even ask um more questions on the part on, on the particulars of that so what, what else bothers you guys about the necromancy thing while we're here my thoughts are also how did he do this okay so i don't know that's so, what you're aiming at but you're, you're, yeah yeah no so that, that's definitely one question is like factually speaking okay like what is going on here okay uh what did he actually do okay good what else? Also, why these people specifically? Yeah. Why these three specific Rishayim? Okay. Uh, you have lots of Rishayim uh, to choose from. Okay. Um, like 
I don't know. Um, like, I'm just trying to think if there are any examples of, uh, you know, you know what would have made sense maybe? I mean, maybe not, this is not the exact thing, but like, you know, Eliyahu Navi uh, was, um, was, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, opposed the priests of Baal. Okay. And this was under the reign of Ahav, right? And Ahav had a bunch of Avodazara that he uh, was promoting in, um, uh, uh, you know, worship of Baal, right? So like, I don't know, maybe ask Ahav, maybe ask like Yeravim ben Navad, maybe ask Menashe, you know, there are a lot of other Rishayim that we have. Maybe ask the people who were there at the time. Yeah, Fega? Why Rishayim? Good, that was the other question I wanted. Okay, so why Rishayim? Okay, like why not also or instead ask Tzadikim, right? Like, I don't know, Rus, right? Who converted or uh, other famous converts uh, if it was... Uh, uh, you know, more recent Shmayev of Talion, who were the two heads of the Sanhedrin who converted, who I'm pretty sure lived before Uncle. Actually, you know, maybe they lived after Uncle. Maybe you can't ask them. Okay, but um, okay, now I got I got to look. Hold on, Shmaya and of Talion, they were converts who lived at the pre Mishnahic era, first century BCE. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, they they did come before this. You know, so like. Like why uh, why only ask Rushaim, right? At least get both sides of the picture. Okay, good. Okay. Those are the questions I wanted for the necromancy thing. Okay, what are the other questions? Either I mean if you have more questions on the necromancy, great, but uh, other questions. Yeah, Fega. So this is kind of, like I just kind of find their backgrounds interesting in that like Titus is obviously right. Like they're all obviously Rushaim, but I find it interesting that with Jesus, they're still like they're saying he's he's in he's grouped with these really terrible people and yet they still kind of have a claim to him and that they still acknowledge his Jewish background and it just seems like right. okay. something interesting there. Let's make this into uh, uh, another category of uh, of Jesus-centric uh, questions. Okay, so so what, what are, like, what hmm, do we make of this portrayal of Jesus? Okay, so one thing is, uh, that I am curious about here is like um, why does the Gemara end off with a, for lack of a better term, limud zuchus, uh, like a favorable uh, judgment on on Jesus in comparison to Bilam? Okay, and I, I and I, I'd add to that like like is this is this a separate idea or is this to be regarded as part of the idea of the whole anecdote. Okay, what else is, can what I, else, is, yeah? So I can I just add to that? And also I think it's interesting that um, they all bring like uh, proofs, like uh, Psukim, yeah. and uh, Jesus is the only one that quotes like Chazal, which I think is a little ironic. Uh, that is interesting, yeah. So I actually, you know, you're right. The way I wrote the dialogue, it's Jesus is quoting Chazal. I don't know if that's actually the way you're supposed to read it. It might be that that's the narrator of the Gemara. Um, and in fact, I think that makes more sense. Um, so I, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to write that question just because I'm, I'm not 100% sure that Jesus is actually quoting uh, the Gemara. Yeah. Um, okay, what else is is weird about the Jesus part? Yeah, Pega. It's like the flip of what Billam says. Yeah, right. So, um, so what do we make of the fact that he says the opposite of what Billam said? Okay, I think there's another thing that's weird though. Okay, if I if I asked you what was Jesus's sin, what would you have said? I don't think there's a specific answer, but like, what, what what might you have said? Turning people away from God. Yeah, right. <laughs> Turning people away from God, right? Being the founder of a new religion, you know, something like that. So, what I find weird is why is is Jesus's sin, um, 
uh, mocking the words of the sages. Okay, like why? Like you know, uh, you know, isn't he guilty of far worse? Right, namely leading leading people astray from Hashem and Torah. Okay, I just think this is a weird, um, <laughs> weird way to characterize Jesus's uh, sin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ayala. So maybe we ask this question a little bit, but what is the conclusion? Is it like in conclusion of like Unclose's question about should he convert? And yeah. if so, like, how is it an answer at all? Okay, good. So what is the uh, what is the conclusion of the story? Right? How is Unclose's question answered? And by the way, just to show you how the Gemara ends. Um, all right, where are we here? Uh, I guess I need to open it up. Um, going back to the Gemara in Gittin 56, 57a. So the Gemara ends up saying, um, yeah, Tanya, it was taught in a Brisa, Amar Rabbi Elazar ba uh, ba ba kama gadola kocha shal busha shahari sa'eya hakadosh baruch hu es bar kamsa the hechri ves beso v'sarav es hechalal. Um, come and see how great the power is of shame for hakadosh baruch hu assisted bar kamsa, uh, who has experienced shame, and then due to that, then God destroyed the temple, and that's the end of the entire kamsa bar kamsa thing. So it doesn't even go back to like uh, Unclose's conversion. Okay, so that's a good question. Right. Any other questions? I feel like there's some big picture questions that would be useful to ask. And this is this is part of the methodology here is like knowing, you know, we're very good at asking questions on Mishle, okay, but we're less experienced in asking questions on Midrashim. And, uh, you know, it, just like in any area, then asking the right questions is going to be the key to unlocking uh, the answer. So how we frame this is going to be very important. Yeah, Ayala. So I guess what significance do their punishments have? Yeah. And okay. why does it matter? Okay, good. Um. So, uh, yeah, let's go, uh, da, 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 da. you know, I think maybe the best way to do this is to ask like this, okay? What do we learn from each stage of the, of the dialogue with each of these three individual, three individuals? Okay. Um, so there's the, there's the A- the question about Israel's status, okay, B, the response, and C, um, the, the the punishment, okay? Um, and so that needs to be asked for uh, for all three, right? Is that, is that the best way to put it? Yeah. Who's important in the world where you are now to Israel? Should I cling to them? Um, yeah. You know what? Sorry. Hold on a second. Too. Uh, maybe a better way is to say it like this. The question about Israel's status and the response, Okay. B is the the question about conversion and the response. And then the three is the question about punishment uh, and the response. Okay. And um and then within each of those, you can also ask like why is each of why is each of these Rashaim uh getting that specific punishment? Yeah, and uh, I'm going to move our question about Unkelos is uh, who's important here. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, say let's say Uncle. Why is Unkelos asking who's important in the world to come? Um, why is he asking about their punishment? The punishment of these Rashaim. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Ayala. So this is more general. Yeah. like included in a lot but just what is the subject of this entire story yes, that's what i was that is what i was waiting for someone to ask okay so what is the subject of this uh of this talmudic anecdote okay so what are some possibilities of uh like like you know that you might say that the subject is maybe the role of jews among the nations i don't know okay. that's what is this I'm about thinking. About like the the uh, the role or fate of Israel among the nations. Okay, what else? Right. So one is, or is it about Unkelos? Right. 
um you know like this might be a uh, part of the genre of uncle's uh, story uh, you know um the larger context uh is or is this about the the destruction of the second mikdash okay even though it doesn't really seem to be about that you know uh or is this uh, or is it about these rashaim and Unglos is just being used as like a platform, you know? So I think that's a, a key question. Uh, and it could be about multiple things. I mean, you know, uh, but but we need to know, like, is there a, a central uh, focus here? Okay. I think those are the main questions. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to just consult my notes uh, from when I was uh, preparing this. Okay, so the way... Okay, I mean the way the way that we ask the question, how literal is the story in all of its details, especially the necromancy part? I think that's kind of implicit in our questions. But let's just ask it explicitly here. Okay, is um like to what extent is this? I like, get not to what extent. Um, which parts of this story are literal and which are not, and how do we know? Yeah, Nava. Well, it's also just occurred to me. I don't know if it's worth asking, but maybe why is it Uncle's wanted to convert, or like kind of what drew him. Right. This. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, where should we put this here? Um, we'll put this under the Uncle Los section. Um, yeah. Uh, why did Uncle Los want to convert? Now, it's possible that the Midrash is not answering that and that there are other Midrashim like that Fega mentioned that are answering it. Um, but I think it is worth asking. Okay, what other questions do I have here? Um, yeah, why did Uncle Los go about uh, his conversion decision by raising people from the dead? Um, oh, this is a good, a good question. If Titus got punished, for doing what he did, then why is he advising Uncleus to do the same thing, right? Uh, and I don't think you can ask that. Uh, well, you maybe you can ask that about Billum also, but um, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll say alternatively, um, if Titus was punished for uh, oppressing the Jews, why is he advising Uncleus to do the same? Okay, that is another question. What other questions do we ask? Uh, what takeaways are we supposed to get from Uncleus? Okay, what are we learning from each step of the dialogue? Um, why is Jesus' sin characterized that way? Why does the Gemara conclude with a praise? Yeah, okay, fine. So basically the same questions. Okay, so um, before we go into the... Yeah, Ayala. This is more just a factual question that I think I'm just not really understanding is sure. how we're understanding the ends, like about the difference between the sinners of Israel and the prophets. Yeah. Is it... Is that saying something that like it's better to be a sinner of Israel than a sinner among the other nations and therefore you should convert or is it like its own separate? I mean, I think we asked that, but yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll add that though. Uh, where did I put, yeah, conclusion story. How's one this question answered? Uh, what is the takeaway message for us? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to start off with is this question of what parts of the story are literal and what parts are not, because I think this is a question that comes up when you do a lot of Midrashim. Okay. So I don't know. What what are your thoughts on how you would approach that question? Or what's your what are your intuitions here? Yeah, Ayala. I think maybe try to learn it as the story and then and like get the ideas from it. Yeah. And then I don't know, either after seeing whether it's literal or not really. Okay, so one thing is, to, one approach is to focus on the story itself and just like not care about whether it's literal or or, or uh, non-literal and then uh, and then like see what results from that. Okay, I think that's a, that is a fine approach. That's probably what I would have done as well. Okay, so let me introduce you to something. Uh, some of you may have learned this before, but Avram ben Ramam wrote uh, uh, an essay, uh, a treatise, I don't know how you want to say it, uh, about Midrashim. Okay. Now, unfortunately, uh, the the one site that I know of that has it seems to be down, unless it, unless it changed since then. Okay. So uh, it looks like it's still an error site. So it's on www.daat.ac.il. Okay. Um, the uh, the 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 saving grace here is that. Um, Avram ben Ramam wrote it in Judeo-Arabic and it was translated into Hebrew. And unfortunately, we don't have access to the Judeo-Arabic. We only have access to a translation. So I do have an English translation, okay? And if you've ever seen the, actually, let me just do a, a, our, our traditional uh, book advertisement here. Um, hold on.
I think I have to de-blur my background. Uh, oops. Sorry, hold on just one second here. Did it, oh, I keep on doing this. Okay, hold on. Uh, do not blur. Okay, so there, so there is a good new edition, which is this one. Okay, which is Ma'amar al Hadrashos ve al Hagados, uh, published by the latest and best translator of the or publisher of the Amram and Ramam's works, whose name is Moshe Maimon. Okay, related to uh, the, the the Ramam. Um, he has published so far an edition of the essay on the Drashos, and he's published Amram ben Ramam's commentary on Breshis and on Shmos. Uh, it is like. Not only is it great, but it is in terms of like footnoted books in my life, it has the best footnotes like uh, uh, you know forever. Like he basically brings down all of the statements of Avram and Ramam and the Ramam and all the Rishonim and all the Gaonim on everything. Okay, so that's very good. Um, and and he basically did a critical uh, translation. He knows Judeo, Judeo Arabic, so he does try to take the standard Hebrew edition of this drush of this essay and he like updates it based on like knowledge of judeo arabic even though we don't have the manuscript okay however there's also this english uh i think it's pretty old this thick volume called ain yaakov which is a translation of all the midrashim in the uh in the talmud um and in the is it the beginning or the end in the beginning they have a translation into english of this essay from avram ben Rabbam. okay i have a pdf of it uh which i can send you um, it's not the best translation, okay? Uh, so, but because we don't have the Hebrew right now, then we're gonna have to use that, okay? So this is this is uh, translated by Rabbi Yako, sorry, Rabbi Abraham Yako Finkel, okay? Um, and uh, and so we're gonna just rely on this, yeah, Ayala. Does Abraham and Rabbi have a commentary on Jerusalem, or it's just this introduction? Uh, he has, uh, he just has this preface, but what he does is he brings examples of a bunch of different midrashim, and he comments on them in the examples. In fact, uh, I don't know if you remember this in Lom Deha, we did a, uh, I think the shear was called like Chazal's method of how to deal with the Yitzhahara or something like that. And uh, I went through an example of Amram ben Ramam's commentary there. So he like, he gives examples and he actually starts off by saying that, um, I'll just read it from the English here. He says, it is important to understand that the homiletical, homiletic ex expositions and stories in the Talmud have underlying meanings and are shrouded in secrecy and most of the commentators did not even attempt to probe their meaning. My father, the Raman, had in mind writing a commentary on the Agados as, as he mentions in his commentary on the Mishnah. Yet in the end, he decided against it as he say, stated in the beginning of the Mora Hanavuchim, applying to himself the passage, Moshe was afraid to come close to it. So Ram actually wanted to write a commentary on all the Agadata, on all the Midrashim in the, in the Talmud, and he decided not to. Okay, and then um, and then I'll just read this paragraph here. Uh, Avram Ramam says, However, after my father's death, I decided to write a few explanatory remarks on the subject in the hope that it will be helpful to the students in this of this field. If you follow my guidelines in understanding the Agadic teachings of the sages, you will come to grasp their deeper meaning, and as a result, you will not make light of them or deny that they are true. Neither will you fall into the trap of thinking that the miracles that happen to the sages are as momentous as those that happened to Moses and Israel at the parting of the Red Sea, or as remarkable as the parting of the Jordan uh, for Elisha and Elijah. Uh, such misconceptions arise when you take the drush, literally, and accept only the surface meaning of the text. But there's abundant evidence to show that agotic tales and teachings, aside from their plain meaning, have profound hidden significance. My father already made this clear in his book. I merely want to explain it in greater detail by classifying the, the Agados into different categories and citing examples for each category. Uh, but first, I want to make a few introductory remarks. Now, another thing also I should mention about this English translation is there are certain parts which I don't remember if they were censored or if they were omitted uh, intentionally. Uh, but the Hebrew version that I have is um, has those parts that are uh, you know, is, is the full version. So, um, so what I want to do today uh, as maybe the last step of this year, we'll see how much time we have afterwards, is he goes through and he gives um, five categories of of, of, agado, uh, of agotic statements and then five um, categories of um, Talmudic anecdotes, okay? Uh, and just to review, uh, what do we mean by agada? See if you remember from our uh, Torah Ball terminology, what does agada mean? Or Midrash agada? Yeah, Ayala. So the non-halachic teachings yeah, of the... exactly. So Agada is the non-halachic teachings of Chazal. Okay, so this can include uh, philosophy, 
ethics, science, advice, history, etc. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to read in the English translation because that's all we have right now. And then, uh, and I'll just take notes to summarize here. Okay. And as we read, think in the back of your mind, which category does this fall into? Okay. Does, does ours fall into? Okay. So he says, um, with God's help, I will now proceed to classify the Drushot, uh, script, scriptural expositions in the Talmud, breaking them down into five categories. Okay. Oh, sorry. You know what I should mention? Um, so Agada is the non-halakhic teachings of Chazal. Drush is is the is Chazal's uh, ex, expositions on uh, Pesukim. Okay, so that's why like it's viewed as like a Venn diagram. There are Drushos, which are expositions on Pesukim that are halakhic. Okay, and then there is the genre. Okay, I'm not gonna actually make this Venn diagram. Actually, maybe maybe it's more than Vendak. Okay, there's halakhic drashos and agadic drashos. Okay, and then there are agadic statements and agadic drashos. Okay, so meaning agadic statements are not tied to psukim. Okay, they're just like like statements, and then they're the ones that are tied to psukim. So this first category is five categories of agadic drash. Okay. So they are as follows. He says, the first category consists of drushos. Oh, by the way, in 2020, I gave a set, I think a five-part shear on the entire Amram Minaramam. So if you're interested in like a shear on this, then you can go through that. Um, I, I actually am reviewing it because I might want to give another series on it um, now that I have the critical edition. Okay, first cat. we're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read these categories. The first category, or maybe we will <laughs> because we have it in English. The first category consists of drushos that should be understood in their literal sense since they contain nothing but their plain, obvious meaning. Although this category needs no illustration, I will give you an example anyway to make it unmistakably clear. I have in mind the Gemara in Brachos 31a that expounds you are forbidden to, to fill your mouth with laughter in this world. For it says when God will return the captivity of Zion, then our mouths will be filled with laughter. Okay, so the first category, category one of Drusha, is, um, is uh, I, you know what I can do? Even though I can't put it on the screen, uh, I can just read it. I can just check it over in the Hebrew here. Um uh just to because I, I trust this Hebrew way more than uh than the English. Okay, so here he says, uh, and I'm just gonna read the um not the whole thing, just the uh, heading is Drushos Kipshutan. Okay, so is Drushos that are uh that were said only for their surface meaning, okay, uh, and are intended okay, uh, yeah, let's leave it like that. Okay, fine. Okay, so that that's the first level. Okay. Second category is second category of Drushos covers interpretations that have both a literal and a figurative meaning. Um, this uh, in in uh, the Hebrew here says uh, shutan, oh, sorry, Drushos Shiesh uh, Nigla Vinistar, okay, open and concealed. Um, since the sages meant to convey the figurative rather than the plain meaning of these sages sayings, they couch them in such a way that their plain meaning represents the opposite of their figurative and true meaning. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll give this example here. This is, um, I'm not going to give his uh, his interpretation. Most of these have been explained in the Mor Nebuchim and in the commentary on the Mishnah by the Ramam. An example of this kind of rabbinic exposition is found in the Gemara Antinus, where it says, Rabbi Eliezer says, in the days to come, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make a circle for the righteous and he will sit among them in Gan Eden. Every one of them will point his, fi their, his finger at God and say, as it says, and they will say on that day, behold, this is our God. Let us exult and rejoice in his deliverance. Okay, so drushos that have an external... Uh, and uh, uh, um, an internal meaning, and the intent is only the internal. Okay, so that's I think I think you know most of us default to this when we think of like like midrashim, like that you don't take them literally and they have an internal meaning. Okay, but the Amram Ben Ramam is going to give us more uh, precise categories. Okay, third category, third category embraces expositions that have only a simple meaning. See, I don't like this translation. Okay, whatever. But this simple meaning is so puzzling that most people cannot understand it. And if you do not, if you do understand it, you will find that the composition of the piece is unclear and confused, and its wording is vague and ambiguous. Therefore, be careful when you study such expositions, and don't be hasty in figuring out what they mean, because you can easily reach the wrong conclusion and the wrong idea. Okay, I'm going to read this in Hebrew. Ella kavanas haomran hu niglehen bilvad. Okay, that's much better. So it is drushos that have no internal meaning, 
and their intent is only their external meaning. Okay. Ella shahavanas hanigla hahu yikshe al rov hamainim ashlo yuvan. Okay, but their external meaning is extremely difficult to understand. Vim yuvan, and if they're understood, tiye havanas havana chasera umishubeshes then your under, the understanding is going to be, and if they are understood, then you're, it's very prone to like having an incomplete or mixed up, uh, messed up understanding. Um, and then he says, He says, many times you can, uh, uh, you can walk away with the opposite understanding of what Chazal intended. Okay. Um, and, and then he says, um, Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this. Uh, either because the person who's analyzed them doesn't understand what words their uh what the intent is in the words, or they don't understand that the words are stated with uh with a homon uh, homonymous meaning or like a equivocal meaning that they're said you know in, 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 intended to be understood in a different way. Um, uh, hold on, but note. Yeah, uh, he says, uh, he says, um, this group is very similar to the to the previous group. But sometimes it's even uh, more difficult than the first one. Uh, the previous one, previous one. Therefore, you need to be careful with it. Oh, this is interesting. Therefore, you should also not go too far in explaining them so that you don't fall into error. Okay, so in other words, like this. Category one has only a surface meaning, and the surface meaning is relatively accessible. Category two has a surface meaning and an internal meaning. And the surface meaning is absolutely like not meant to be taken literally or even like you're not meant to analyze it. You're just trying to get to decode it. And the real meaning is in the decoded version. The third one has only a surface meaning, but the surface meaning is extremely difficult and prone to mistake. And sometimes like it is um, uh, you, uh, you know, you, you might take it at face value and be led astray, or you might make the opposite mistake of taking it as a total mushal, you know, and not getting the, the the meaning. And the example he gives is the one that I gave Shiran, which is a person should always incite his Yitzhar Tov against his Yitzhar Hara. Uh, if he overcomes his evil impulse, fine. If he cannot, he should recite the Shema. Um, uh, for the verse continues, reflect in your hearts while on your beds. Uh, this alludes to the Shema. Uh, if this works, fine. If not, remind yourself of the day of death. So he says... Although this exposition means exactly what it says, it is difficult to understand it because the terms Yitzhar and Yitzhar Tov are unfamiliar and the suggested ways of overcoming the evil impulse are baffling. So it, it, you can go back and review that here if you want, but like, yeah, you need a correct understanding of what we mean by Yitzhar Tov and Yitzhar Hara. And, you know, most people think that it's just the, the angel and the devil on your shoulders, that this one tells you to do good things and this one tells you to do bad things. And that's wrong. And also, most people think w that when it says you should say the Shema, it means you should say the Shema. But really what it means is you should contemplate God's oneness, and that should have a certain effect on you that is going to like have a mitigating effect on your Yitzhah Hara. So it really does mean that you should pit your Yitzhah Hatov against your Yitzhah Hara and then say the Shema and think of death. But the the meaning is in the surface level is very, very deep. So it's not accessible to most people. Okay, fourth category consists of metaphoric interpretations of certain verses. However, the sages did not suggest that their figurative interpretation is the actual meaning of the verse. God forbid to think that. Okay, so um, I'm going to read this in my good edition here. Drashos sha'amru alei mashalam osu v'be'ur p'sukim b'derech malitzas hashir. Okay, so these are drashos that were framed as explanations of p'sukim but were not intended as interpretations of those psukim. Rather, they were only like um, said by way of asmachta, okay, is like textual illusion. Okay, so he gives examples, which I think will be clear. He says, an example of this kind of exposition is the Gemara in Tainus 9a, where Rabbi Yochanan says, what is the meaning of the passage aser ta'aser? Okay, so it says aser ta'aser, which means you shall surely tithe. And then Chazal say it means 
Aser Kadesha Tis Asher. We did this in Pirkei Avos. You should tithe so that you should become rich. Okay? So a person who is ignorant of Chazal would read that statement of Chazal and think that this is the shot of the Pasuk or that this is an interpretation of the Pasuk. Really, though, it's not. Really, there's a separate idea of like how giving tzedakah can make you wealthy. And Chazal, Chazal are just uh, uh, attaching it in a cutesy way onto the Pasukim. Okay, so they never intended, he says, do not think like people who are unable to grasp the real truth and who think that such metaphoric interpretations are traditions like the expositions of the laws of the Torah. Okay, that is not so. Uh, the fact that the interpretations of passages that do not involve fundamental laws and principles are not based on tradition. Such expositions were thought up by the authors according to their own, uh, own understanding. Many of these interpretations are vehicles to, to express lofty ideas through allegories, parables, and symbolism. Okay, so so in other words, you know, when Chazal say that ayin takas ayin, that eye for an eye, is referring to monetary, um, uh, uh, you know, compensation, or that pre hadar refers to the esrog, those are drushos that are actual interpretations of the psukim that were handed out at Har Sinai that like are meant to be taken literally as the real real meaning of the psukim. But when, uh, you know, when Chazal say you know, yased tiyelacha al azaynecha. That that when the pasuk says that you should have a peg with your weaponry, and then Chazal say al tikri al azaynecha el al oznecha. Don't read a peg on your weaponry. Read uh, um, on your ears, and this means whenever you hear lashon hara, you should put your fingers in your ears. You know, that's not a an interpretation of the pasuk. It's really a separate idea that they're just attaching to the pasuk. Okay. Then the final category is the fifth category comprises drushos that contain exaggerations. Okay, um, uh, so this is um, in the Hebrew version. Drushos sheish ben guzma. Guzma is hyperbole or exaggeration. Um, okay, and then uh, he gives his own example. Uh, my my favorite example is uh, that it says, um, uh, I think I quoted this recently in a shir, that there was a woman uh, who gave birth in Egypt to 600,000 babies. Okay, and then uh, and then uh, it says, who was that? That was Yocheved, who gave birth to Moshe Benu, who's equal to all of Kali Yisrael, you know, numbering uh, 600,000. Okay, so um, this is drushos that were said by way of hyperbole. Okay, and um, he, Avram ben Ramam quotes, oh, you know, is this only in my edition? No, okay, fine, okay. So those are the five categories of drush. Okay. Then he goes through the five categories of anecdotes. Uh, and, and oops, sorry, I'm just a second here. Okay, so he says, um, the uh, agotic anecdotes can be divided into four parts. You're going to see it's really five categories, okay? One, true stories that serve as precedents for the purpose of deciding a law, okay? Um, oh, hold on. Okay, yeah, this is very unclear. Okay, you know what? Hold on. Okay, uh, really, this is okay. The, the first category is anecdotes that uh, that are designed to teach useful lessons. Okay, and then you have a subcategory of this, which is um, which is lessons in law. Sorry, lessons in law. So this is an interesting category because it's uh, it is an anecdote, but. It has halakhic ramifications. Okay, let's see if the example he gives is, is relevant for us. Um, okay, fine. So just an example here. It says, an example is the case of a person who is sitting uh, with his head and the greater part of his body inside the sukkah, but with the table outside the house. Uh, Beit Shammai declared that the sukkah is invalid, but Beit Hillel r r ruled that it is valid. Said Beit Shammai to Beit Hillel, did it not happen that the elders of Beit Hillel and the elders of Beit Shammai once went to visit Rabbi Yochanan ben, ben Hachoranit, and they found him sitting with his head inside, and it goes through the whole thing. Okay, and so it is an anecdote that is being brought to decide some point of law. Okay, two, which is part of really category one, stories that are told to teach a moral lesson. Okay, famous one, person should always be gentle like Hillel and not impatient like Shammai. And then it has the whole story about how the guy was like, a, a, a guy's friend made a bet with him to try to like provoke uh, Hillel and he didn't succeed. Okay, so this is lessons in morals. Okay, third, is anecdotes that convey a fundamental religious principle, like the following. Okay, so this is the story of Choni Hamagal, okay, uh, davening for uh, for rain. Okay, so um, so this is lessons in uh, ideas, okay, uh, like philosophical ideas, I guess. 
philosophical ideas. And then the fourth category or subcategory is uh, tales that point out a miracle or an amazing incident. Uh, like the following story about Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Huda, and Rabbi Yossi who were traveling on the road. Rabbi Meir deduced from the innkeeper's name that he was dishonest and subsequent events proved him right. Many similar incidents can be found in the Talmud. Okay, so this is um, uh, um, anecdotes anecdotes that record miraculous events uh, that teach us um, uh, you know, lessons. Okay, so those are the four categories of anecdotes that are designed to teach lessons. Okay, so subcategories okay now the second category of anecdote he says then there are stories that did not actually happen but were seen in a dream okay um so th this is a strange thing okay i, I don't know uh, you know why has all recorded their dreams he says the sages expressed these in terms of real events because they believe that no reasonable person would ever mistake dreams for actual facts uh like the following rabbi shmuel ben elisha said it once happened on yom kippur that i entered this the innermost part of the sanctuary to burn the incense and i saw the lord of hosts seated on a high and exalted throne and many other stories okay i think i did this in a wednesday night cheer last year about um this is the anecdote where he saw god and then it's about how hashem davens okay um uh, and he says, the same is true of stories that tell uh, visions of prophets, how God spoke to them, and stories about demons. A naive person who thinks that these things happen exactly as they were recorded and believes these things are, not, are impossible is foolish and ignorant of the laws of nature. For in telling the stories of miracles, the sages follow the example of the prophets who told in plain language uh, what they saw in their visions, as my father explained in the Morning of Bukham. So category two is, um, is events that occurred in dreams, but were told... Uh, as if they were real life events. Okay, real events. Yeah, Ayala? So I have a question on 1D. Yeah. And so I guess, is there a way, two questions. One, is there a way to differentiate between 1D, let's say, and 2 of like things that are miraculous and things that are not actual real? There is no reliable method. That's the difficulty. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> and, and uh, you know, and it's interesting. Uh, in the footnote, he comments about how, uh, Rabbi Maimon comments about how, um, how, you know, Avram ben Rambam is, you know, not the type of person who takes, uh, you know, like just every statement of Chazal as a miraculous event. Yet there are other statements that he does take as miraculous events that happen to Chazal. And and there's no reliable, like, like way to tell the difference. Okay. And we'll see that in, in the categories three, four, and five. Okay. Also, uh, another question, question, Andy. Yeah. So is, like... It sounds, it seems a little different than A, B, and C in that category. Yeah. It's teaching lessons on, like the miracles can be teaching lessons on either of the three, like laws, morals, or ideas, or is it a specific type of lesson? Yeah, so it sounds like the what unifies all of these categories, uh, sorry, all of these subcategories of one are real, yeah, hold on a second, anecdotes about real world events that are taken literally that are designed to teach useful lessons okay and then these other categories are going to be not taking them literally okay you you'll, you'll i think it'll be clear when we see all the categories and then we could uh, uh talk about the differences now at this point um i did actually make a pdf of these last three categories so I, i'm going to switch uh, i'm not going to do the english anymore uh so this is category three uh incidents that occurred in reality but they their their telling was told uh, uh, with hyperbole. So incidents that occurred in the world. Uh, so things that happened in the real world, but they were told in an exaggerated manner, and no intelligent person would ever um, uh, make a mistake and think that they actually happened. Okay. Vuhu Kamosha Amr Bugumara Tamid, Dibra Torah Lashan Havai, Dibru Navim Lashan Havai, Dibru Chachamim Belashan Havai. Okay, so it says in the Gemara that the that Psukim speak in, in in hyperbole, the Navim spoke in hyperbole, and then the Chachamim spoke in hyperbole. Okay, and uh and he he uh he goes on with that. Okay, then he gives an example that we're familiar with, I think. Uh so an example of this is the story of Rabbi Z Rabba and Rabbi Zera at the Purim Suda. Rabbi and Rabbi Zera made a Purim Suda together. Come Rabbi, Rabbi got up, shachted the Rabbi Zera, and he slaughtered Rabbi Zera. Uh, then he requested, he asked, he davened for him, and he was uh, uh, resurrected. 
Okay, so that's what the Gemara says, and here's Avram ben Ramam's uh, interpretation. Pirusho, the explanation is shihikahu maka gedola upatsa bo chabura gedola asha that he uh, he hit him with a lethal blow and injured him to the point where he was on the brink of death. Ulagodol hamaka hahu hahi korehu blushin shachte, and due to the like uh, the 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 size of that wound or the magnitude of that wound, it says he slaughtered him. Maybe he said this, or maybe it said this because uh, it was, he wounded him on his neck. And when he says he resurrected him, it is being said like the Navi that he was resurrected from his illness. Until the, the wound is, uh, is, is enlivened. So, uh, so category three is anecdotes about real world events that are told in an exaggerated uh hyperbolic manner okay so the story of Rabbi Rabbi Zira, real world event he actually wounded him but it expressed it as he killed him and he actually davened for him to get better uh but it expressed it as he was resurrected from the dead okay so real world event but didn't actually happen the way that it says it okay category four and he gives another example but we're not going to do that right now category four uh, uh, events that happen in reality, but they are told allegorically or as a riddle. Okay, so Aram Naram says, These things happen in real life. But they are told in an allegorical manner. Um, and we should understand from them, from this, that you shouldn't... Uh, explain these things to every person. But when you explain it to a Chacham or a Navon, then he'll understand the meaning. It will seem from the external sense of these uh, stories that, that these are like wondrous and uh, precious things. Sorry, that these are valuable uh, 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 uh Beautiful and, and valuable things. And some of these things contain uh, matters that even a simpleton or a child recognizes that they are impossible. Some people will believe these things and take them literally, even though uh, the, the the external meaning is impossible. Uh, but someone who really knows the nature of the world and its existence, and he knows that the derech of Chazal is to talk in allegories and riddles, they will understand the mashal and will recognize it for such. Okay, so he gives an example. Um, he says, Okay, so I'm actually going to read this from the translation in uh, in uh, on Alha Torah. Sukkah nun gimel amud aleph, I think is what it said. Yeah. Okay, so it says like this. Um, uh, Solomon. Yeah. The Gemara relates with regard to these two Kushites, okay, so uh, Ethiopians. Uh, who would stand before Solomon, uh, Elichoref and Achia, the sons of Shisha. So the, these are two guys mentioned in the Pesukim. They were scribes of Solomon. One day Solomon saw that the angel of death was sad. He said to him, why are you sad? He said to him, they are asking me to take the lives of these two Kushites who are sitting here. Solomon handed them to the demons in his service and sent them to the district of Luz, where the angel of death has no dominion. When they arrived at the district of Luz, they died. The following day, Solomon saw that the angel of death was happy. He said to him, why are you happy? He replied, in the place that they are asked me to take them, there you sent them. Okay, and then the Steinfeld uh, translation commentary says, the angel of death was instructed to take their lives in the district of Luz. Since they resided in Solomon's palace and never went to Luz, he was unable to complete the mission. That saddened him. Ultimately, Solomon dispatched them to Luz, enabling the angel to accomplish his mission. That pleased him. Okay, and then the Gemara concludes, immediately Solomon began to speak and said, the feet of a person are responsible for him. To the place where he is in demand, there they lead him. Okay, so what does Avram ben Ramam say? He says, Hini pshat hamaise nimna minia gemur lechol balseich of vina. The, the external literal meaning of this event is impossible to any intelligent person, meaning you can't talk to the angel of death, okay? Uh, you can't send people with demons, okay, to go to a city. 
But the Avram ben Rama says, it seems to me, which by the way, Ayala, this is a good example, that Avram ben Rama is not 100% sure. He's saying, it seems to me that this happened in real life. So he says, it seems like these were real guys. And these guys were actually like, you know, um, in danger of dying because of some illness or some other thing. Barata Liknos Tahbula Lahatila Minamavis and Shlomo tried to find some way to save them from death. Vihivricha Minha Aratahi, El Eretz Acher, Shahisa Tova Lahem, and he sent them away from uh, the land of Israel to some other land, I guess in Luz, which was better for them health wise. Lufi um Lufimash Hayutrichum Lufi Mizgam, based on like what they needed and based on their temperament. In other words, like like in the old days, they would send people to like resorts to recover from illnesses. Um uh, so what happened? Uh, he thought that they'd be uh, uh, saved there. However, they died in that place. The very place where Shlomo thought that they would be saved. Uh, and they were they died there by the will of God that no one can escape from. And that's why Shlomo concluded by saying, that man's feet, um, what did it say? The feet of a person are responsible for him to the place where he is in demand, there they lead him. So in other words, uh, let me summarize the category and then summarize what he meant. Anecdotes about real world events that are told in an allegorical or uh, manner or as a riddle. Okay, so again, here we have real world event Shlomo actually had these two servants, and what happened was they were going to die. He sent them away to save them, and they died. But the Gemara expresses it as Shlomo talking to the angel of death, who was sad because he couldn't kill them here. Then he sent them uh, by through demons, and then the angel of death was happy uh, because uh, Shlomo enabled him to fulfill his mission. Okay, that's category four. Okay, and then category five is... He gives more examples. But category five. Okay. This is the thing that throws a monkey wrench and everything. It says, you should know in order to understand the great benefit from these Talmudic anecdotes that sometimes you'll find an anecdote that has a combination of two or more categories. Kagonchaya part of the anecdote occurred in a dream, and the another part occurred in real life. And part of it was told as an allegory. And if you try to use one method to explain it, you're going to get confused. And you're not going to get the, the point of the uh, incident. Um, uh, then he goes back and he says, you should know that the drashos are also hybrids. So the category here is hybrids. Okay, mixtures of the previous four categories, um, which if you attempt to explain it based on a single approach, You'll you'll miss the point, okay. And then he went and added a sixth category, which is hybrids. Sorry, I said hy yeah hybrids, okay. Mixtures of the previous five categories, which if you tr attempt to explain it based on a single approach, um, sorry approach, uh, you'll uh, you'll uh, you'll miss the point, okay. Now I think I have to read this example. If I remember correctly. Um, yeah. So let's read, read the English here. Chagiga 14b. We're going to wrap this year up in, in, uh, in another uh, five-ish minutes. Okay. So there was an incident involving Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai who was riding on a donkey and was traveling along the way. And his student, Rabbi Yolanda ben Arach, was riding a donkey behind him. Rabbi Lazar said to him, my teacher, teach me one chapter of Maise Merkava, right, which is the deepest ideas of metaphysics. He said to him, have I not taught you, quote, and one may not expound Maise Merkava to an individual unless he is a sage who understands on his own accord. 
Rabbi Lazar said to him, my teacher, allow me to say before you one thing that you taught me. In other words, he humbly requested to recite before him his own understanding of the issue. He said, speak. Immediately, Rabbi Yochanan ben Sakai alighted from the donkey, he got off the donkey, and wrapped his head in his cloak in a manner of reverence, and sat on a stone under an olive tree. Rabbi Elazar said to him, my teacher, for what reason did you alight from the donkey? He said, is it possible that while you were expounding the divine, uh, the Maiz Merkava, uh, and the Shekhinah is with us, and the ministering angels are accompanying us, that I should ride on a donkey? Immediately, Rabbi Elazar ben Arach began to discuss Maiz Merkava and expounded, and fire descended from heaven and encircled uh, all the trees in the field, and all the trees began reciting song. What song did they recite? Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters in all the depths, fruit trees and all the cedars, praise the Lord. An angel responded from the fire, saying, this is the very Maiz Merkava. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai stood and kissed Rabbi Elazar on his head and said, uh, Blessed be the God, the Lord of Israel, who gave our father Avram a son like you, who knows how to understand, investigate, and expound on Maiz Merkava. Um, there are some who expound well, but do not fulfill well, who fulfill well, but do not expound well. You expound well and fulfill well. Happy are you, uh, and, uh, our father Avraham, that Allah ben Rach came from your loins. Because that's the whole story. So uh, Avraham ben Rahman quotes it, and he says, So he says, part of this story definitely happened in real life, as we said, part of it was in a dream. Um, and so so this is from the, the first two categories that we mentioned. Um, he's going to give one more example. So this is the, the next story in uh, that happened with Rabbi Yeshua. Okay, so it says, and when these matters um, were recounted before Rabbi Yeshua, he was walking along the way with Rabbi Yossi Kohen. They said, we too shall expound on the design of the divine chariot. Rabbi Yeshua ben, ex began expounding, and there th that was the day of the summer solstice, uh, when there are no clouds in the sky. Yet the heavens became filled with clouds, and there was a, an appearance of a kind of a rainbow in the cloud. And the ministering angels gathered and came to him, like people gathering and coming to see the rejoicing of a bridegroom and, and a bride. Rabbi Yochanan, the priest, went and recited these matters before Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who said to him, Happy are all of you, and happy are the mothers who gave birth to you. Happy are my eyes that saw this. Um, as for you, I saw in my dream that we were seated at Mount Sinai. Okay, it goes through the whole thing. Okay, fine. So Avram ben Ramam says, um, First, some of it is from the first category of real-world events that are told literally. Some are the second category, which is a dream. Some are the fourth category, which is allegory. The, the, the principal matter from the first category is these two sages were actually talking about Masim Rekava. The second category is from the fact that he said explicitly, I saw in my dream. And the fourth category of allegory is where the angels were gathered. And then Avram ben Ramu doesn't explain it because it's a secret. Okay, so to, to, to summarize here, uh, anecdotes, which is what we're dealing with, there are real-world events that are told literally that you have to either learn from them a halachic insight, a moral lesson, a philosophical idea, or learn from the miracle. Two, there are events that are occurred in dreams, but they're told as though they happened in reality. Three, there are uh, uh, real-world events that are told in an exaggerated, hyperbolic manner. Four, there are real-world events that are told in an allegorical manner or as a riddle. And then five, there are hybrids. So the question is, which one is our, our story about Uncle Us? What would you say? Yeah, Ayala? I would think a hybrid. Okay. Of what makes you think maybe, that? Maybe, like, I think maybe, like, I mean, Uncle S, I guess, did really convert. So okay, that good. part of, like, him thinking about it is true. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I think that it is a hybrid because we know that Uncle S converted, okay? Um, and he probably went through some decision-making in his conversion, okay? Um, uh, and so it could be a hybrid, all right? Uh, any other uh, theories? Hybrid is always the safe the safe guess, right? Okay. I I personally think that this is a uh, category four. Okay. For the same reason that you think, which is that we know that Uncle is converted. And I'm just gonna like leave you with, with this one thing and then we'll stop this year and you can think about it. Is I think that this is 
actually anyone want to theorize about how to approach the uh the midrash uh if this is a hybrid or a uh or category four no i'm not asking for a full explanation just like any intuition that you want to like verbalize before i verbalize my intuition Okay, I'll leave you with my intuition here, which is that um, Unculus really did convert, okay? And he went through, he, he like every convert, went through some decision-making process. And I think that these these three, like, consultations with the dead represent three factors he considered when he was converting to Judaism, okay? Uh, and uh, that remains to be seen. Okay, so uh, Blee Netter, next week we will uh, decode the Midrash, and, uh, uh, but you can think about it in the meantime. Okay, I hope this was a fun uh, adventure. <laughs> okay, have a good Shabbos, and uh, talk to you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good Thank Shabbos. You.